My name is Debbie Jirt. I am a conservation scientist. I work for Esm Velo KZN Wildlife. It's the provincial conservation organization in KwaZulu-Natal. And my organization tasked me to investigate the feasibility of incorporating drones into our work plan. Okay, that's me, my email address. So we partnered with a whole lot of different stakeholders and we really tested a range of drones for a whole lot of different conservation scenarios and I'll only be able to show you a few of them. But really how you can apply drones in conservation is as rich as your imagination. So we started with really entry level drones, 5,000 Rand, all the way up to the, the Sense Fly drone. So the first scenario we tested was in Wienan Game Reserve, it's near Escort. And this was actually a farm that was expropriated by the then government in 1948. It was a labor tenant farm and it was completely overgrazed and very, very eroded. So it was expropriated and it went through a couple of departments till eventually it landed up with KZN Wildlife. And it's a real interesting case study because we put in a, well, over the years, a lot of con erosion control features have been put in place and we need to monitor these to make sure that they are still in place. So we can send a ranger out, but the reserve is quite big and there was a lot of erosion. Or we can use freely available satellite image. So on the left, you can see um, the highest resolution freely available satellite imagery, that's spot six. It has a re resolution of 1.5 meters. You really can't see what's going on. So we flew over with an Albury drone, flew down the, the catchment area, and that little red square at the bottom, we can zoom into that, and now we can see the detail of the erosion control features. So it's quite easy for the manager to check what's happening on these erosion control features, and also where there's been a breach, and he needs to repair that dam wall. Then we did some work with um, bird collisions with power lines. Um, so especially in misty conditions or, or um, over dark conditions, it's very difficult for birds to see power lines. And it's quite a, a big mortality factor associated with birds colliding with power lines. So we wanted to know, we, we do counts of birds that have, um, the kind of birds and how many birds have co collided with power lines. So fortunately, no birds had collided. So we were forced to improvise. So we used a, a greenback jersey vulture, my jersey, <laughs> and we put that down on the ground underneath the power line. And then we flew a transect along that power line and we could then go through that imagery and we could very clearly see the greenback jersey vulture. <laughs> Sorry, just another point on that. EWT is working on a project with ESCOM. So what we do, they put up little flappers on the power lines so that birds can see them and avoid flying into them. And to put that up, you have to work with ESCOM, you have to get a cherry picker truck, you have to drive through the vault, you need a very experienced person to put those flappers up, the wires are live, so there's a safety risk for people. And they are developing a little dispensing mechanism on a drone that can now easily deploy those flappers on to the power lines live. So there's a huge safety element savings there for, for humans, as well as cost and time. So still in, in Wien and Game Reserve, there's been a lot of invasion of small acacia trees. And this is a problem. One, it reduces grazing, so our, our grazing animals lose out. And then two, the tourists who come there can't see the animals because you just see trees. So we conducted a, a a herbicide trial where we sprayed different sections and we needed to evaluate how successful that herbicide trial had been. So we sent the drone up. The image on the left is your normal color image and you can see the little gray blobs, all the trees that have died. And it appears gray because they are thorn trees. Those are the thorns that you're seeing on the, on the background against the bark. But then we also used a multispectral sensor and the red colors are actively photosynthesizing and the yellow colors, not, they are dead. So now we can evaluate the success of that trial. 
We can also use the imagery to look at large tree mortalities. We can map our alien plants. We can use it for plant species identification if we have the right sensor. And then another thing we have to monitor is our threatened species. So here we monitor Cape vulture, Cape vulture nests, and Cape vultures nest on, nest on cliffs. So the typical way that we do this is we walk to the base of the cliff and we stand at the bottom and we have binoculars or spotting scopes and we peer up onto the cliff and we try and count the birdies. I can tell you that the birdies camouflage really well with the color of the cliff. And they also nest in little potholes or on ledges, so it's very hard to see them. So with these people down at the Oroby Gorge colony, they sent a drone up which allowed you to fly parallel to the cliff face, so you didn't have that oblique vision. Now you can zoom in and all of a sudden you can see all of the birds. So for instance, the top two left birds, we would not have picked up in our traditional method of monitoring. What about the results? Well, um, if we compare since 2001, our standard visual method of counting, we only detected between 17 and 58 nests. But when we used the drone technology in 2017, we identified 94 active nests. Now that is almost a 100% increase in the success rates of detecting these nesting birds. We also realized that the colony wasn't just 120 individuals, it was closer to 200 individuals. Now I wish I could say that the population of the bird colony had actually increased, but it's not. It's because of a superior way of collecting the information. Then coming back to management, again, this is in Wienan. The managers need to know how much of a reserve has burnt at any one time. So we sent the drone up, we could mosaic the images together, and it looks rather funny. You've got all these funny lines. Now, as I said, Wienan was a labor tenant farm. They did have agriculture there, and those are the contour banks that you are seeing. So there's a legacy effect of previous land uses in this reserve. And you can very see, clearly see that it creates an uneven burn across the landscape because the contour banks concentrate water and nutrients, so you get a higher biomass of grasses along the contour banks. So when you put a burn through there, it's not an even burn across the landscape. It's quite heterogeneous. And that's valuable as a, a manager or an ecologist to understand that. We also tried to use drones for game counts. These are elands in the Drakensberg. And whilst we had success, I mean, we can fly over, we can count the animals, it's not better than our current methods. And where we need a lot more work is not so much on the drones themselves, on the crafts, we need it on the software and the artificial intelligence that can now help us to automatically identify animals, and it must be different kinds of species, and animals don't look the same from the top as they do from the side. They look very different. And then it must also automatically count them for us. And that was the problem, was the processing time using drone technology, but that will change in future. Then we also did bird counts. This was at Ndumu, and again, it's a beautiful pan if you haven't been up there, lots of hippos, crocodiles, and the only way we can count the nesting colonies of pelicans and yellow-billed storks is to be in the bird hide across the side of the pan and use our spotting scopes and our binoculars and count the birds that we can see. But we can only see the birds at the front of the tree. So we're only getting a portion of the population count. So we drove around the pan, sent the drone up, all of a sudden we can see all the birds and the nesting. And it was very interesting. These nesting birds were not disturbed by the drone at all. And if you look very carefully at the bottom right of the right-hand picture, you can see crocodiles. So we want to see if we can use drones to count crocodiles. And next week we'll be trying nesting crocodiles. And it's quite nice to use a drone for that because crocodile mothers get very territorial. If you get close to the nest, they come rushing out the water and try and bite you. So I think it'll be nice to use a drone for that project. Okay, then, um, this was actually taken from man flights, but the technology could equally be applied to drones. And here they're using aerial photographs to do animal age determination. So again, it's coming back to the software value add to drone technology. 
So they can measure the shoulder height of the, of the elephants in the entire herd and then come up with a full herd age determination as well as sexing the animals. Okay, this is interesting work that NASA was doing. Um, they created an algorithm that allows you to see through water um, in the marine environment. So you know in the marine environment there are waves and ripples. It's very hard to see through that. So they developed this algorithm called fluid lensing. It's very clever. As a wave goes over, it's uh, convex. And at the top of that convex part, it actually magnifies. And you can see very clearly through that. So they track all the convex parts of these waves, stitch it together, and voila, you can see through the waves into your coral reefs underneath. So the images on the right, you can see fish species like parrotfish, sea cucumbers, different coral genera, and sharks. So all of a sudden, the whole marine environment has opened up to the drone industry as well. But now, as a conservation organization, we need to be very cognizant of what impact drones would be having on animal species in the reserve. So we've done a few preliminary tests and we need to do a lot more. And we flew a fixed wing, the Sensefly EB drone, over a giraffe cow and her calf, and she was so protective of her baby, she ran. She hated that, that drone. That was at 85 meters above. But I mean, she's, it was a, a young calf and she was so protective. Then we flew it over some rhinos. They were pretty chilled. We could get up to 60 meters. But again, if those animals are in a hotspot reserve where poaching is rife, their response is going to be very, very different. So we need to come up with a guideline to understand the impact of drones on animals in our protected environment so that when people come and work here, we don't impact animals unnecessarily. And similarly, if you're trying to count nesting birds and you get too close and you flush them, you're not going to get the results that you want. Then we also need to be aware of bird of prey interactions. So overseas, they are actually using birds of prey as a drone deterrent, um, especially like for paparazzi and VIP people, where drones are being flown over these people's yards and in intruding on their privacy. You train your bird and they have such good eyesight that they can actually see in between the, the multi-rotors of a quadcopter and they can put their claw in between them but they do put little leggings on them just in, in case they don't get it right. But we have noticed some bird interaction. So I believe a, a filming company lost their drone, I think, to a fish eagle the other day <laughs> in Zululand. So just be aware of bird interactions. Um, so it's not just about counting plants and animals and making maps. We could also use it for ecotourism marketing. We have beautiful protected <coughs> areas. And we can show these in a completely different light to the standard imagery that we use. And then our technical services could also use it for infrastructure monitoring. And here, you know, there'd been a, a rainfall event and it had done serious damage. And despite the staff taking photos and taking it to management, there was no buy into this. But as soon as they could show them a video taken of the drone, flying up there to show the full extent of the damage and what needed to be done, all of a sudden we got management by and, and we could repair that road. So of course there's anti-poaching, we've heard a lot about that. We haven't had complete success with the anti-poaching, it's something that's ongoing in our smart parks, but we could also use drones for law enforcement. And then a project we hope to trial soon is search and rescue, so in the Drakensberg, hikers go missing unfortunately and we had a case in December with a hiker going missing. I think in excess of 70 million rand was spent on that search and rescue. The SAPS police helicopter crashed so again there's a, a risk to people involved in this including the search and rescue dog which you know takes a lot of money to train a dog up. So if we could in find a way to integrate drones into our search and rescue, we might be able to find people sooner. And if they're still alive, we might even be able to take essential supplies to them before the <coughs> rescue people can actually get to them. And then general protected area management. But it's not without challenges. So um, the GPS isn't always that precise. It landed in the tree. <laughs> Fortunately, it was a small tree. Um, we have experienced some camera failures. And then, of course, 
with, especially with the multi-rotors, it's the flight times and, and the battery life. So I hope there's going to be a whole lot more technology development on, on the battery life of things. And then wind. But the speaker yesterday showed that we can imitate dragonflies and have a wind um, propeller system that is really stable. So I'm hoping that's going to become a thing of the past too. So in summary, drones offer an exciting and useful new tool to add to our conservation toolbox. And we really do want to use the drones as a tool, like we use cameras and GPSs currently. We don't really want to become drone experts. And our drones are well suited to fine scale projects or difficult or dangerous places to get to or work in. And we would certainly integrate this into the full scale of things. So we would have the drone going up to the manned flights, going up to satellite imagery. So it's not to replace those. Then we have detailed mapping capabilities. We get really large file sizes. So we need to consider big data and how we deal with that. What's really nice is the various sensor capabilities, um, like thermal, and maybe thermal imagery is, would work better for our game counts than the standard counting that we've tried to do now. It's a rapidly evolving technology and software capabilities with many new applications across multiple conservation sectors. So it's so much more than just rhino anti-poaching. And then we need to develop new assessment techniques. So for that, like for the Cape vultures, we need to now be able to compare our results with a new technique to the historical counts to actually understand population trends. And we would really love to partner with any organizations or research institutes who would like to take this particular area of research forward, and sponsorships are welcome to you. Thank you.